This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the first video for Unit 14 on the digestive system. In this video, I'm going to discuss the structure and function of the alimentary canal. In digestion, we have the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food so that we can absorb the nutrients that are found in food. So that in digestion, you have not only this breakdown, but you have absorption and then elimination of the waste products that you don't need or there's nothing left of nutritional value. The digestive system, which is also called the alimentary canal, goes from the mouth to the anus and also includes some accessory organs, some other parts that are not found in that canal, in that long tube, um, but also are, are providing substances that are necessary for digestion. And our human digestive system is well supported by a microbiome, uh, a collection of bacteria, which help us digest the polysaccharides that we can't break down, synthesize some important vitamins for us, and also helps detoxify the things that go through our digestive system. So this shows you both the digestive system organs and the accessory organs. So in the digestive system itself, or the GI tract, the alimentary canal, <coughs> as we see it starts up here with the mouth, travels through the esophagus and down through to the stomach and then we have over to the small intestine and the large intestine and then out through the anus. The accessory organs that are part of this system, we have the various structures inside the mouth, the tongue and the uh, salivary glands and such, the gallbladder and liver that we'll talk more specifically about what these things do and the pancreas. So those will all be covered as what part of the accessory organs for the digestive system. The alimentary canal itself is about 28 um, feet long, 9 meters or so. And as you can see, the bulk of that is actually coming from the small intestine, which starts right here at the end of the stomach until over here where it runs into the large intestine. So it runs between 6 and 8 meters in length, uh, 22 to 25 feet. This small intestine is where all of your absorption happens, and so there we want to have your body uh, plenty of time to pick up all the nutrients that have been digested. Digestion basically ends here once you get out of the duodenum. Um, the bulk of the actual breakdown has happened at, through that point, and so you can see we've got quite a long time to absorb things. That's what's so important about what's going on in our digestive system. Maybe we should call it the absorption system, digestion and absorption. The digestive system, the wall of the digestive system is all very similar, uh, no matter where you are from, from the pharynx where things start at the end of the mouth going all the way out to the anus. It basically has four layers. It has a mucous membrane layer. Remember that mucous membranes are found in cavities that are open to the outside. And I'm sure you can picture that your digestive system is a, a just basically a tube through the middle of you, and it is open to the outside on both sides. There is a submucosal layer of connective tissue found under that. And then there is the muscle layer, which includes both circular muscle that goes around this tube and longitudinal muscle that goes lengthwise. And then surrounding the whole thing, we have a serous membrane layer. And serous membranes, remember, this is like the fist in the balloon, where you have both an interior, a, a visceral layer, and a parietal, a outside wall layer, with a little bit of space in between with some serous fluid. And this allows the organs of your small intestine to sort of uh, flex and move as, um, without causing friction. The um, serous layer around your small intestine, though, is very complicated. And so we've got a, um, a section here, a sagittal section, to try to give you a little bit of an idea. But, you know, it's wrapping around all of these organs and in and out and all up and around. Uh, there's a few things that are sort of outside the serous membrane. As you can see, the pancreas is sort of sticking out in the back, and this is a little bit of the duodenum coming out. Um, if for some reason it sort of scoots out behind the serous membrane and then comes back in again. So you have all of these membranes holding things together, and then you also have a big, long fold of a membrane called the omentum that goes down the front like an apron over the front of the small intestine hanging down from the stomach, and you also have 
um, in between everything here, layers of membrane that's known as the mesentery. So you're really tied together quite a bit with membrane, and there, these are, um, it is set up so that the organs in your digestive system can have some space to move and flex as food is going through there and kind of suspended in your abdominal cavity. So the whole point of the digestive system is to get food from the ingestion side of your mouth all the way through where the important things can be taken out and then you can excrete or eliminate the waste products. And so the work of that muscle layer, that third layer in your digestive tube, is very important. And when you uh, alternate in, in the proper order the contraction of these circular fibers with the longitudinal fibers, you can do a variety of things to the stuff that's inside the digestive system. So that food can be churned or mixed, a little bit segments. Uh, you know, segmentation refers to this picture right here, which happens in the small intestine, where just a little a little part, a little segment goes, you know, back and forth and things get really get mixed around quite well. And then food moving through the system or progressing through the digestive system is done by a process called peristalsis, a wave-like motion. We see that down here at the bottom where that uh, relaxation of the longitudinal muscles followed by contraction of the circular muscles sends food down the tube. The digestive system is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system, and so it is upregulated. It is turned on by the action of the parasympathetic nervous system. If you remember that the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight part, but the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. So, of course, it would be the one that would be controlling the digestive system. So let's start out here at the top with the mouth. The mouth's job is to bring food into the body. It ingests the food and starts breaking things up mechanically by chewing with the teeth. We have saliva and mucus being produced by the, the salivary glands to help moisten. We've got an addition of a enzyme salivary amylase that helps start breaking down carbohydrate, carbohydrates. We call this ingestion and chewing up mastication, and it involves, of course, a lot of work by our, our lips and our cheeks and our tongue to manipulate the food around, put it underneath the teeth, uh, move it to the back of the mouth to swallow and such, so that all of those parts of your body are very much involved in getting the food going uh, into your mouth and down into your digestive system. The teeth are actually the hardest structures in the body, and there are the outer coating, the enamel coating, is, is what makes it you know, the, the hardest. That's the hardest thing that you can find. We have 20 primary teeth that are lost. They're known as deciduous teeth. Um, as you become older, I'm, I know you're all very familiar with the fact that you get baby teeth and you have adult teeth. And 32 secondary teeth, though some of those may not erupt. Some of the wisdom teeth may never appear in your jaw, depending upon your own uh, situation with your teeth. So we have a child's skull here on the right showing that the, the uh, secondary teeth are developing down here in the mandible, um, in the bone itself, and then the cells that put the enamel on the teeth as they erupt are right at the eruption point. So as the tooth moves forward, it destroys the enamel, the, it destroys the cells that make the enamel, which is why the enamel that you have when your tooth erupts is the enamel that you will have the rest of your life. It will eventually wear down. It can be uh, worn down by eating a food that is not clean, has bits of dirt in it, or you know by, by actual physical trauma. And if you have any kind of um, taking any medication or such when these teeth are being developed, that also can affect the enamel. And so that, that there's not really anything you can do once that tooth has erupted. The enamel you have is the enamel that you're going to have forever. Along with this enamel on the outside, then the next layer down is dentin. And so this is very, very similar to bone. So it's really a bone that's coated with a harder substance to make up the tooth. The center part of the tooth has got the blood system and the nerves. This is known as the root canal. Um, when, you, when a dentist does a root canal on you, they are destroying the nerves in that part of the tooth. So the, um, it refers to where the, the dentist will be working. The part that shows above the gum line is known as the crown, and then the part below the gum line is the, the root. The 
uh, teeth are sitting in. This is an immovable joint into the bone, and there's actually ligaments holding the teeth to your, into your jaws. Some of the words for teeth, I'm sure you're familiar. We've got incisors in the front that help us bite things. Um, and then you have the canine teeth or the um, cuspids that are more pointed and make a, a, you know, can work their way through tougher materials. The um, premolars then become bicuspids. That's another word for that. And they're sort of smaller versions of the molars. And then you've got your big grinding molars teeth in the back all the way to wisdom teeth, which, as I said, some people, they don't ever erupt or people have to have them removed because they are causing pain and are impacted. But if you have a large enough jaw and are successful, you can have 32 teeth in your mouth when you are finished uh, erupting them all. So after you move out of the mouth, we move down to the pharynx, the, the back of the throat and the esophagus. And their main job is to mainly just, is just to be a passageway. There's no digestion that happens in the pharynx and the esophagus. The, um, but peristalsis, and I can see now, I noticed that I had a little overrun of my picture has taken out my words here, um, but that the movement of food down through the esophagus happens by something called a peristaltic wave, and if you've ever swallowed something that just didn't go down very smoothly, uh, you took a pill and it, and it kind of felt like it got stuck, or you, you know, had too big of a piece of something kind of hard, you can sort of feel this peristalsis. You can feel it all the way down your esophagus as it moves slowly. But this is where I was saying that the longitudinal muscles will relax in the front and the circular muscles contract behind to move the food down. We call the food a bolus. This is, this is a, um, hard to read here, but bolus refers to that chewed uh, ball of food that has been moistened by the saliva and the mucus in your mouth and it's on its way down to the stomach. Swallowing is a reflex, so that you set it up by mixing the food and moving it to the back of the mouth, and then the reflex takes over, and the food moves its way down. The, since you're swallowing, you're putting food into an airway passage, we need to close off some things, and so your palate, the soft palate and the uvula, raise up to close off the navel cavity so there won't be any backflow of food into that part of your body. The hyoid boin, the hyoid bone and the larynx also elevate and so that the epiglottis can come down to close off the top of the trachea. So now we've got the airway all closed off. The muscles of the pharynx contract at the same time of the muscles of the esophagus relaxing. There normally is a sphincter, a circular muscle keeping the esophagus closed right down there by the larynx. And this relaxes and then this peristaltic wave pushes food down through the pharynx into the esophagus and then down the esophagus to the stomach. Um, basically this situation is in, happens in reverse if you should happen to vomit. In, in that case you don't have a peristaltic wave pushing things up once you've opened up all the space but you have the contraction of the abdominal muscles um, that will send the contents of the stomach back up and out. These are some pictures just showing what happens then in swallowing. You've got the food bolus again here in the back of the mouth and that the, uh, the um, sphincter muscle, the circular muscle of the, esoph the, of the esophagus normally is closed and then as everything sets up that the uh, epiglottis moves down and the glottis moves up to kind of close everything off then this sphincter will open and the wave of peristalsis will send the food down through the esophagus heading to the stomach. There's also a sphincter at the other end of the esophagus into opening up into the stomach and it has to open to let the food down into the stomach so it can start digestion. So this, even though this is a tube that goes from your mouth to your anus, there are a lot of, um, not necessarily valves, but similar to valves, sphincter muscles that close things off. So it's not open from one end to the other. It's set up to make things, make sure that things flow basically just one way. So the stomach is a pouch-like organ that hangs below the diaphragm in your upper left quadrant of your abdominal cavity, and it can hold about one liter. So the people that insist on, uh, you know, chugging a gallon of um, various Kool-Aid or milk are going to be uh, really pushing their stomach to the, the absolute limit and may find it coming back up with that reversed, really, you know, the, the reversal of contents known as vomiting. In the stomach, you have the start of protein digestion. 
and some absorption of, of a few things, water, some salts, some lipid-soluble drugs will go into the bloodstream, and alcohol will be picked up by the stomach. <clears throat> there are two key, well, actually three kinds of cells I want to mention. The parietal cells in your stomach secrete hydrochloric acid and gastrin, uh, a hormone that's involved in encouraging more digestive action to happen. The chief cells secrete pepsinogen, which is an inactive form of the um, digestive protein known as pepsin. So it has to be activated by the acid in order to start digesting things. And then you have mucus cells in your stomach, which produce alkaline secretions to help coat the stomach. So because you are making hydrochloric acid in order to activate the pepsin, in order to start breaking down things in your digestive system, you don't want to be breaking down your own stomach. And so your body also, as a fail-safe, pr provides a thick mucus layer that's highly alkaline that will neutralize the acid when it's getting close to the actual body cells. And so this helps keep everything safe so that your stomach does not digest itself Things that go through the stomach move through at different rates, and so something that's liquid is going to pass through the fastest, followed by carbohydrates, proteins, and then fats. So fats can stick around three to six hours, uh, depending upon the, how much you've eaten, um, so that everything doesn't move through at the same time. So here's a diagram of the stomach. You can see that it has you know, a curved shape. We've got a greater curvature here and then a lesser curvature and food moves through the stomach this way. You can see we've got various muscles going in different directions so it really allows the stomach to sort of churn and squeeze and move the food all around in various ways. As the food moves down through the stomach and is sort of piling up here in this area of the, called the um, near the pyloric, the pyloric canal, you know the, the um, so the bottom of the stomach, after it has been mixed and, and thoroughly started on digestion, then you would be triggering the opening of this sphincter here, the pyloric sphincter, and then moving into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. But it will stay within the stomach, as again, as I said, uh, depending upon what kind of food it is, certain different amounts of time to allow this digestion to be very well established. This is just a close-up of that stomach layer. We've got the um, mucosa layer and the mucosa and the submucosa and muscle layer and the serosa layer, that, those four layers found throughout the digestive system. And then looking down, here's your acid-secreting cells or your parietal cells, your pepsinogen-secreting cells, those chief cells, and then we've got mucus-secreting cells here at the top, keeping everything <clears throat> protected. Below the pancreas is, or below the stomach, is the pancreas, which we've talked about because it is an endocrine gland. So today we're going to be looking at its exocrine function. Most of the cells in the pancreas are exocrine cells, and they're known as acinar cells. The secretions that these cells produced go into a pancreatic duct. Remember, exocrine glands put secretions into a duct, which then goes someplace else, and it connects to the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, along with the bile duct, which comes from the liver and the gallbladder, so that, that it is dumping um, things, liquids for digestion into the small intestine at the very top of the small intestine, where food is first coming in from the stomach. Oh, also, when food has been mixed up, when it's coming, being swallowed down your esophagus, we call it a bolus of food. But when it's all been churned up in your stomach, it starts, we call it chyme, um, C-H-Y-M-E. And so at this point, once it's gone through your stomach, we talk about the contents of your digestive tube as being chyme. Inside the juice, the secretions produced by the pancreas, we have various enzymes that are necessary to digest the carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and the nucleic acids that are released every time you break up a cell. And of course, we're eating living organ or what was living organisms, be it a plant or an animal. And so those cells will have nucleic acids and we need to digest those as well. Like in the stomach, these enzymes are secreted as inactive so that they will not be digesting uh, any part of the, you know, the pancreatic duct as it moves along. They have to be activated, in this case, by the action of other enzymes, not so much acid, but they need to be activated once they have reached their position of work into the small intestine. 
So here's just a short diagram showing that here the stomach we, we would be uh, the stomach would be above here. The pancreas sits below it and to the back, um, targeting or, or snugging up on one side to this first part of the small intestine. This is your duodenum, and so your stomach is attached to the duodenum, and at the other part of the pancreas, it goes all the way to the spleen. This diagram also shows the liver, which sits above the um, stomach and the pancreas, and the bile or the gallbladder, which is actually kind of behind everything. You, it's the liver's drawn to be transparent here. Normally, all that you would see would be this little tip of the gallbladder hanging down. So this lists the things that are in the pancreatic juice or the secretions from the pancreas. We have pancreatic amylase that will digest starch, just like the salivary amylase. Pancreatic lipase to digest lipids. And then we've got three that work on amino acids, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. Peptidiase, sorry. Carboxypeptidiase. There are two nucleases to digest nucleic acids and then to help neutralize the acids that's coming from the stomach in the chyme, we have bicarbonate ion that is the HCO3 that we have talked about in relation to blood, it's just a very, very important buffer in a variety of settings in the human body. So the liver is the largest single organ in the body, excluding the skin, um, you know, as, as kind of a one, or the bones and muscles tissues, you know, as one particular mu uh, organ that you could hold in your hands, the, or the liver is the largest one. And it's actually, as you can see on this picture, we've got the rib cage right here. It's actually nestled under your ribs. Your diaphragm does not run at the bottom of your ribs. It's sort of up here in the middle. And so the, the liver is tucked up right under the diaphragm, and it is protected in the front by the lower couple of ribs. It's protected in the back because you've got those strong muscles around your back and your spinal cord. It's an extremely important organ because it has a huge number of functions regarding how you are metabolizing the food that you are bringing in. And so it's, it's uh, taken care of by being put in, in a very uh, safe place. There are two main lobes to the liver. We have a right lobe and a left lobe. The right lobe is larger, and then there's a number of smaller um, parts in there. Along with the, metaboli the metabolism functions that the liver undergoes, it also makes bile, which is involved in digestion. And so it processes the products of digestion, and it helps contribute to the whole digestive process by adding bile to the mix in the small intestine. So these are just some of the things we, we talked earlier about the hepatic portal system, and I don't have a slide about it on this particular video, but if you remember that you have the blood coming from your digestive system, passes through the liver first, <coughs> through some enlargements in the liver um, veins or the, in the capillary beds known as sinusoids, hepatic sinusoids, and that allows the liver cells then to pull things out of the blood and work with them to do uh, various functions such as making glycogen or breaking down glycogen back into glucose if their blood glucose goes too low or changing other things that are not carbohydrates into glucose when acted upon by certain hormones such as cortisol, uh, making lipoproteins and phospholipids and cholesterol, various structures that have lipid components, converting things into fats, deactivating amino acids by taking out the amine, amine function, that's the NH2 ion, um, should be just a negative sign there, and instead of leaving, instead of having it pick up another hydrogen and becoming ammonia, which it could be, and ammonia is a poison, but it actually turns it into urea, which is kind of a safe way of dealing with this nitrogen, and then urea gets excreted through the kidneys. We talked about the plasma proteins when we talked about the bloodstream as being made by the liver. Um, there's, there, we talked briefly back with the macromolecules that certain amino acids are essential. You have to eat them, but other ones you can make them. And so the, the ones that you can make by yourself can be handled by your liver. They can make there's there. <coughs> There are approximately 22 amino acids that are used in making all the proteins, and um, seven to eight of them are essential, and so the rest can be made by the liver. And then it's a storehouse for glycogen as well as iron and certain vitamins that are fat-soluble. 
The liver also is a place where we have worn out red blood cells being phagocytized and other um, immune system responses. And then it detoxifies things such as alcohol and other drugs. Uh, many things go through the liver before they act on the rest of the body. And doctors in prescribing certain drugs have to be aware of whether that drug is going to have a first pass through the liver or not. So bile, as I said, is the thing that is excreted by the liver that is part of digestion. It's this yellowish green uh, color, and it is stored in the gallbladder. The gallbladder doesn't make it. It's just a storage place. In bile, the most important part is that it contains bile salts. The bile pigments are things like bilirubin that we talked about are part of when the red blood cells are recycled. This is the part of red blood cells that's not recycled, it's just removed. And so um, that gives bile its, its interesting color. Bile salts are important because they break fat globules, which may be too large to be digest, may be taken in, uh, absorbed, they break them into smaller pieces, or is what's known as emulsification, so that they <coughs> excuse me, can be absorbed and can be utilized in the body. Bile salts also help us absorb certain lipid-soluble things, the fatty acids and the cholesterols and the fat-soluble vitamins. Remember, most of you is water. Plasma is basically water. Cells inside are pretty much water. And so anything that is fat-based is going to have difficulty moving within your cell, even if it's essential, unless it has been kind of properly coated and packaged. And so bile salts are involved in that. And they are continually recycled. This is not something that you use it and then eliminate it, but they are brought back into the liver and reused until they can't be used anymore. So this is just an illustration showing that if you leave fat by itself, it's going to all blob up. But if you add a bile salt, which has a hydrophobic side, that's the fat-loving side, and a hydrophilic side, the water-loving side, they can surround a piece of fat and um, make it uh, so that this outer white water-loving um, outside will allow it then to slide into the high water content of your cells in your body. Now moving on to the small intestine, so that food has been started in its digestive process in the stomach. It has been broke, the large proteins and such have been broken down into smaller amino acids or at least smaller peptide strands. And now that moves into the small intestine. As it moves into the small intestine, the, the triggering of the chyme coming through that pyloric sphincter triggers a lot of other uh, hormone releases to stop the stomachs working quite so hard and to gear up things into the small intestine. It's all a very finely tuned system with detail that um, I'm not going to go into in this video. But in the small intestine, this is where digestion is completed and absorption happens. And that's why the small intestine is such a long organ and takes up most of the space in our abdominal cavity. There are three sections, the duodenum, which I've already mentioned, the jejunum, and then the ileum. In the duodenum, this is where the enzymes coming from the pancreas and the bile from the liver are added. So it is at the very top, as you see down here, the very top of the small intestine. It's not particularly long. It's kind of a short little piece, but this is where kind of the, the big work in digestion is finished. And so as things move out of the duodenum and back into the jejunum, that's when we're going to have all of the absorption of nutrients happening. And absorption takes time because in some cases it's by diffusion, in other cases it's by active transport, and you have to allow time for these things to happen in the cells. And so again, things are being segmented and mixed in small sections of the intestine as it moves along slowly. Um, that there's a lot of absorption, a lot of absorptive space in how the cells are set up. I'll get to a slide on that in a minute. And so that, you know, time for all of those nutrients to be picked up. So by the time you've gotten to the end of the small intestine, most of your nutrients have been taken care of. You're sort of picking up the leftover, the bile salts that have done their job and now need to be recycled back to the liver, um, some assorted vitamins. And of course, reabsorbing a lot of the water that's being put into your digestive system happens throughout the whole um, from the stomach on down because you're putting out quite a few liters of liquid as part of your stomach digestive gastric juices and your pancreatic juices and the mucus that's part of all of the inside and so these are being reabsorbed all along. 
Here's a picture of your intestinal wall structure. We have little fingers. of uh, These, again, are many, many cells right now, but they are called villus, and the individual cells are villi cells, so we'll get to that. So the inside of your small intestine, for one thing, is, is kind of folded in on itself so that it's got a higher surface area because it sort of looks like this with these deep folds. And then in it, on the surface, we have all of these taller little fingers that stick up. And then if we go even a little bit closer, you can see that intestinal epithelial cell has microvilli all along the cell membrane as it's the part that's out facing the lumen. So these are our simple columnar cells, epithelial cells. And again, this is an electron microscope showing those microvilli. And so they would be the cells lining those taller villuses. And so all along this edge are these little microvilli, and then they've got teeny, teeny, tiny little... Uh, are these, these cells with the microvilli on it. And so you've got three layers of folding. You've got the folding inside the entire intestinal tube, and then you have the folding of the interior epithelial layer, and then you have the folding on the cell membrane of each cell. And so all of that combines to produce a much higher surface area, a much higher absorptive area, even though you've got about uh, 6 to 8 meters to work with, 22 to 25 feet. This uh, extends it even more by giving so much surface area for cells to interact with the chyme as it gets mixed and moved around, moving through the digestive system. You not only have digestive enzymes being released as part of the pancreatic juice, but they're also stuck on cell membranes. So you have sort of this point of purchase uh, action happening. At the moment of absorption, things can be broken down. If it didn't get broken down enough before, then we can take care of it just when it's time to move things into the cell. So you have peptidases that work on proteins and sucrase, which breaks down sucrose and maltase to break down maltose and lactase to break down lactose. All of these, of course, are um, disaccharides that we want to break down into monosaccharides and then lipase to break down your fats. Lactose, someone who's lactose intolerant is missing this enzyme, and so this lactose is not broken down, and it continues on through into the large intestine, where the bulk of the, the um, microbiome, the intestinal flora, all that bacteria live, and so the... Um, side effects of someone who's lactose intolerance of gas and pain is because this lactose is available for the bacteria in the gut to work on and they're busily digesting it and putting out waste products that make someone feel uncomfortable. So the um, these various ACEs that work as you know, enzymes that work on these molecules then result in individual monosaccharides and amino acids being able to be ready to move into the cell. Both of these compounds require active transport because even though they are hydrophilic, water-loving, the cell membrane of our, excuse me, of your epithelial cells is a lipid, a phospholipid, remember, and so it does not let things move across it unless it's a lipid substance. So looking at these two diagrams down below, you can see that uh, monosaccharides will move into a cell through active transport and then like, may tra travel by facilitated diffusion, <clears throat> which is just diffusion by a particular carrier molecule, no active transport needed. But the first one, at least one step in the process of moving the monosaccharides into the epithelial cell and then passing them on through to the blood will involve active transport. Same thing with your amino acids. These usually involve active transport on both sides, getting into the epithelial cell and then passing on and getting into the blood. So both monosaccharides and amino acids will move through epithelial cells, be absorbed, and then move into the bloodstream. And then they move from the bloodstream to the liver through the hepatic portal system, and the liver will then decide, you know, process and decide where those um, particular compounds need to go next, where they need to stay in the blood and circulate to body cells, or if they need to be taken out and, and put into some kind of storage, such as uh, gluco excess glucose being put into glyc gly uh, glycogen, or the amino acids being sent someplace to make proteins. <coughs> but these two compounds go through the epithelial cells of the small intestine to the blood. This is in contrast to how fats work. So that here we've got our bile salt, 
which then is surrounded in a fatty acid that has been broken apart from a food, a fat that you've eaten, a triglyceride. This is brought into the body cell um, by diffusion because it now has a, a coating on the outside, the bio salts that allow it to go through, and the salts stay behind. That triglyceride inside the cell is given a protein coat, which is then turns into a substance we call a chylomicron. And the fats go into the lacteals, special lymph, lymphatic vessels, that then will transport these um, lacteals. The lacteals will transport these chylomicrons to the bloodstream, but they do it through the lymphatic system so that it's going to be dumped into the subclavian vein and then circulate from the bloodstream up there instead of going into the liver first. They have then, after these um, chylomicrons are traveling throughout the, bu the bloodstream, they, the lipids are pulled away. We have delipidation happening by body cells until there's only a remnant left of the original chylomicron. And these remnants then are sent back through the liver, and they are processed into things known as very low-density lipoproteins, or VLDLs, which then can take the lipids, again, back to the body cells where they are turned into low-density lipoproteins, which is the big bad guy. Having too many low-density lipoproteins is, is now known as to be a risk for certain heart disease conditions, atherosclerosis and laying down of plaques in the blood vessels. So it's a much more complicated process than what happens with the monosaccharides and the proteins, that the fats that you take in go through the... Um, absorptive process end up in the lacteals, get dumped in the blood, and then float around in the blood for a while before they come back to be processed by the liver, and then they float around in the blood again before it comes back to the liver uh, one last time. So after the food has passed through the small intestine, the chyme has made it all the way through the small intestine. If you are in healthy conditions and things have been just sort of moving along at a normal pace, all of the nutrients that are able to be absorbed will be absorbed. And so what you have left is a bunch of waste that has been liquefied. And so you've got excess water in there. You've got some various electrolytes, uh, ions, sodium and chloride and other very important ions that are part of many body systems. And so they need to be reclaimed. And so your large intestine is involved in reclaiming those things that they just your body doesn't just want to throw out. There are quite a few glo goblet cells present in the large intestine because we want to, again, get everything neutralized to hold all of that waste material together to provide lubrication so that it slides on through. So in this electron microscope, the goblet cells are just these big um, kind of pale uh, granular looking cells here. On the, this is the inside of the large intestine. You can see we don't have any villus, any microvilli. You know, there's no reason for absorption. It's just there. It's got still got the, the four layers, but it isn't involved in absorbing anything more than water and electrolytes. And so we don't have to have a, a very fancy high surface area. This is where, as I said, you've got all of the, the bulk of your bacteria that are found in your digestive system are found in your large intestine. They're known as either the microbiome or the intestinal flora, um, which is kind of funny because flora usually refers to, refers to plants. You talk about flora and fauna, and I don't know why bacteria get to be called flora inside us, but that's the word we use. And so they break down large polysaccharides. This should be one word, not two. And they do provide several key vitamins, one of them being vitamin K, which is synthesized by the bacteria. You can eat it and get it from your foods, but also with a healthy bacteria um, in your intestine, you're, they're making it for you. So these are the parts of the large intestine. This is where it will start. So your ileum will uh, have a sphincter that will attach to the large intestine right here. The chyme, the you know remains of the food, will pass in. Here's the appendix, which um, has a number of or, you know poorly understood functions. One of it being right now that some researchers believe that this is sort of a safe haven for the bacteria of your large intestine in case of diarrhea. If the large intestine is being emptied out by rapid passage of food. You also are emptying out bacteria, and so this is a, the appendix is a place where that a certain level that by a certain number that bacteria can hide out and be um, ready to recolonize it when somebody's health is stabilized. Your large intestine 
then travels up, ascending colon, and then across the front of your body, transverse colon, and actually this, you know, your stomach is right over here above your transverse colon. It, it is not behind your small intestine, but it actually is coming in front of your body, kind of under your ribs. Then descending colon, sigmoid colon, because it has an S curve here at the end, and then down sort of the final storage area of the um, feces, the rectum, and then the anus. And you've got two sphincters here keeping everything in until it's time to let it out. You have an external uh, sphincter that you is under voluntary control and then an internal one which is not. And so <clears throat> when it comes time to eliminate things from your large intestine, then we call that process defecation. So defecation often her it happens after somebody has had a meal because the presence of food in the stomach and the presence then of chyme into the small intestine sort of sends a signal that other food stuff is coming and it's time to sort of empty things out. And so it is described as stimulating what is called a mass movement, that there is a big movement of stuff through the large intestine, that things typically move fairly slowly through the large intestine until you have something that stimulates this mass movement and then the fecal matter kind of gets pushed down out of the way. It's time to, you know, make room. There's more food coming. And so then, then it will pile up at the end in the, the rectum. And if there is stretching then, we've got, you know, things coming in and these, these cells are being stretched out to the side, then that's where the, you can have the connection to the reflex that will um, release the internal sphincter. And then if the time is right, you, know, you voluntarily then release the external sphincter and help move things out by doing the Valsalva um, movement where you hold your breath and contract abdominal muscles and increase the pressure in the abdomen to move the feces out. <coughs> but since this is under voluntary control, at least after you've gone through toilet training, you can choose not to, and then you know the, the pressure will go down. Sometimes we can have reverse peristalsis happen, sort of back things up a little bit back into the large intestine, and so then absorption of water will continue, which will result if you don't um, eliminate the feces that are building up. Someone can be constipated and find that the feces, instead of being relatively moist and soft, will become hard and difficult to move basically because it has stayed in the large intestine probably longer than it should have. So that covers what I wanted to go over on the structure and function of the digestive system. There will be another, the next video will be covering the various nutrients that you eat in food and how those are involved in your health.